Fortuna, how to set up and play. So to set up the game, you'll give each player a player board that aligns to one of the sides of the board for their color. Their starting pawn will go there on the road that leads to Caesar's Palace. On each player's player board, they'll get one starting grain, one starting water, and one starting wine. They'll also get one die, one Vestal Virgin, one Centurion, and one disc that they can use to mark if they get married later in the game. For all players, you'll put their disc on value five of the money track. So all players start with five denarii in the game. And then you'll randomly determine the turn order and place the discs accordingly. You'll put three privileged discs, these beige tokens, in the center of Rome. And then you'll align each of the dice cards to their corresponding dice space on the board. There are six cards. These are the Emperor Favor cards. Next, lay out the 12 building cards. Uh, there's four types of buildings, three cards each. If this is a two or a three player game, one of each building type will not be used. So you'll just start with eight available buildings. You'll create the supply of dice and privilege tokens, and then you'll create your privilege card deck. These cards with that icon are only used in a four player game, so remove those from a two and a three player game, shuffle all the cards, and create the privilege draw deck here. Finally, you'll lay out the 12 action cards that are used throughout the game. Each player will start with three of these action cards. The start player that was randomly drawn will always start with the Fortuna card. If this is a beginner game, you can now randomly deal the rest of these to all the players. And if it's fewer than a four player game, you would still deal these out uh, just as placeholders for the dummy players that aren't actively in the game. In an advanced game, you'll actually do a draft for these cards. So the first player will get the Fortuna card and then going clockwise, the player to the left will select their next card, and then one at a time, each player will select card until they've gotten a total of three cards as part of their tableau. Once all players have their three cards, they will flip one over to the gray side uh, to protect it so it can't be stolen during the first round. So let's take a look at what each of the 12 action cards do. So this is the Fortuna card. The player that has this card in their possession at the end of a round will be the start player uh, the next round. Or when this is in their possession and they decide to play this card, they can move up one spot on the road to Rome. This card allows you to immediately take two water cubes and add them to your supply here on the board. This card allows you to take two of the grain cubes, add them to your supply. In addition, you can convert as many water cubes as you like into grain and add them into your supply. This one allows you to take one wine cube and add it to your supply. In addition, you can convert as many blue cubes or water cubes into wine as you like and add them to your supply. This card allows you to sell as many grain as you like for two money each. This card allows you to sell as many wine cubes as you like for three money each. This card allows you to purchase or acquire as many Vestal Virgins as you desire or can afford. Uh, the first one will cost one, the second one will cost three, and the third one will cost five based on how many you currently have. So if you decided to purchase two Vestal Virgins, you would need eight money to pay for those in this example. This card works the same way, but for acquiring Centurions, you can acquire as many Centurions as you like or can afford. The first Centurion on your player mat will always cost one, the second one two, and the third one three. This card allows you to discard or give up a Vestal Virgin in exchange for a dice. The Virgin you give up always has to be in the highest position on your player board. So since this is the highest, I would discard it 
and I would simply take another dice from the supply and add it. You can never only have a maximum of three dice, three virgins, or three centurions. This is the corruption card. You can use it, play it, to get two money, or you can pay one money to another player to use any one of their cards. And it can be one of their face-up or face-down cards. And as we'll see in the course of a normal round, normally when you play a card, um, you have to decide which card you'd like to trade it in for. Um, when you play the corruption card, you still have to give the corruption card up, but it does not have to be swapped with the card that you paid another player to use. You can, you can swap it with any face-up card of, on any of the player spots. This is the marriage card. You pay three money to get married. You would simply slide your marriage token to indicate that you were married. Once you're married and you have this card in your possession, you decide to play it. If you're married, you can instead get a grain, a wine, or three coins. One special power with this is you're allowed to roll your dice first uh, to see which emperor favor you're eligible for, and then you can decide which of these resources to get. You may roll the dice that requires one of these, and then you can make the decision, I'm going to take that one versus this one. The final action uh, is the building action. So by playing this card, this allows you to purchase one building. So these are the available buildings. Uh, each player may only have a total of three buildings on their tableau. You can never have duplicate buildings. And this is the cost for the building up here in the upper right. So you pay with money and then you take the building into your tableau. So let's see what each of the buildings does. This building allows you to get an extra money for each cube sold whenever you're selling wine or grain. So that building is used in conjunction with these actions. So if I was taking this action to sell grain, normally I get two per cube. If I had that building, I would get three per cube. In this example, if I was selling wine instead of three, I would get four per cube. This gives me one extra per cube when I'm taking those selling actions. This building allows me at the beginning of my turn, if, if this spot is empty and I have this building in my possession, to put one water cube there. It's important to remember that the water cube I get does not immediately go to your supply. It simply comes to this card if it's empty. So if you didn't use this cube in a prior round and it's the start of your turn, you don't refill it. You only refill it if it's empty. But then it can be used as if it's any other water cube in your possession when performing actions. This building can only be purchased if you have the money and you're already married. So you have to be married to purchase this card. This allows you to take an additional step towards Rome when you're fulfilling the emperor's request for the five dice. So we'll get to this later. But you can see if you were fulfilling this request, if you're married, you get to move forward one. And if you're married and have the building, each of those would give you one step towards Rome. And the last building, this building allows you to keep one additional privilege card. So as we'll see during the course of a round, whenever you're fulfilling the needs of an emperor, of the emperor, and there were tokens on the card, as long as there were two or more tokens on the card, that means you would draw one card for each token. Normally, you're allowed to only keep one of the drawn cards. This allows you to keep one additional. So you could keep two privilege cards uh, when resolving that phase. So once all players have selected their three cards and they're aligned with their side of the board, as we mentioned, all players will flip one card face down, protecting it from getting stolen in the first round, and then you're ready to start the game. So in a single round, each player will get one turn, and that will end the round. A player's turn has five phases. The first phase of a player's turn is if they have 
the aqueduct card, you'll remember they get to add a blue cube to it if it's empty. That's the first phase only if they have this card. The second phase is to select one of their action cards. At the beginning of their turn, they always flip up any face down action cards. So all three are always available to them at the start of their turn and they have to select one of the action cards to play. Now they're not obligated to use the power or the benefit associated with the card, but they still have to play it. Because when you play an action card, you've got to give it up uh, to another player. So you select one of the actions you want to use that we covered at the beginning of the game. You may choose to resolve it, and then you have to decide which of the other nine cards, three in front of every player, are you going to swap this card with. It can be swapped with any face-up card. It cannot be swapped with a face-down card. That's why the players protected these, because they didn't want to risk those getting stolen. So if a player decides, I'm going to swap it with this card, so it stays face up with this player, and the one you take, that always gets turned face down, protecting it from getting taken from another player. So even though this was set up as a two-player game, we still have two dummy players over here that have cards in front of them that can be taken during the action phase. And as a quick reminder, you'll see that maybe I chose to play the Corruption card. I decided instead of getting two, I was going to pay another player to use one of their cards. In a two-player game, maybe I paid this dummy player, so my payment just goes to the bank. I can play any of their face-up or face-down cards, so maybe I choose to play this face-down card. Whenever I'm done with Corruption, I still have to give the card up. And so I decided to give it up for this card to get that one in exchange for a future action in the round. The card, the action card you give up always has to go to a face-up card. The third phase of a player's turn is military power. They can, if they have a, an available centurion, give up their highest centurion, in this case it would be this one, to use the power of one of their two remaining face-up cards. You remember the one they gave up and took came face down, so they can't use that one but they can use the power of one of their two remaining face-up cards. So they execute the action, but the card stays in their possession. They don't have to swap it uh, with any other player. So the military power is a good way to use the benefit of an action without having to give up the card, and you'd still have it available for you, for you potentially in another round if, if nobody else took it. After the military phase, which is optional, now the player will roll all of their dice. In this case, they only have one dice because they haven't acquired more dice. And then based on the roll of the dice, this gives them access to fulfill some of the emperor demands. Since I rolled a two, I can fulfill the level two or lower demand of the emperor if the card is still face up. We'll talk about how these cards go face down when they get used. If I was to roll a six, I have access now to all of the Emperor's demands. So the more dice you have, it gives you more options because in the higher you roll, you now have option to pick anything at that level or lower. So let's look at each of the Emperor's demands. The one space, and these are always aligned to the same space every game. This is always the one card. You have to give up one of your water, return to the supply, and you can move one step closer to Rome, like that. The arrow always means you're discarding it, and in this case, you can only do it one time. The two dice, you've got to give up wine cubes. You can do it up to two times. So if you give up one, you move one step closer. If you, if you discard two wine cubes, red cubes, you can move two steps closer to Rome. The three space is just like the previous one, but it requires grain. You can give up one or two grain. Uh, for each grain you give up, you can move one or two steps closer to Rome. The four space requires you to discard uh, centurions. You can discard up to three to remove to move up to three spaces to Rome. If you discard only one, you only move one step closer to Rome. 
The five space doesn't require you to discard anything. If you're married, you get to move one step. And, and if you have the building, this one over here that we talked about, which you had to be married to even buy, you get to move an additional step closer to Rome. So if you decide to choose the five and you're married and you have that building, you can move two steps by choosing that one. If you were not even married, that is ineligible to choose. Finally, uh, the sixth spot, for each Vestal Virgin in your possession, up to three, you get to move one step closer to Rome. And notice it's not a discard arrow. You don't have to discard uh, the white uh, virgin markers. For each one you have, you get to move a step closer to Rome. It's important to remember, once you choose which card to resolve, it gets turned face over for the rest of the round. So it won't become active again until the end of the round. So let's say that I'm going after a couple other players that have gone, and I roll the two, so I only have access to this one and this one. Well, obviously, this one is unavailable to me, so this is the only one that I can fulfill for the emperor. If both of these were flipped over and I had no face-up cards, basically that means the emperor's needs have all been met. So no harm, no foul. So there's no penalties, but also I don't get the opportunity to move any steps closer to Rome. If there is a face-up card that I am eligible for, and I choose not to fulfill it, or maybe I'm unable to fulfill it, because maybe I don't have the water that's required to give to the emperor, I am penalized. Um, I am taxed one money, and I have to move one back on the money track. If I don't have the money to pay because of that, I have to move one step away from Rome. But since I was the first player, I had access to both cards, so maybe I chose to give up this one, I gave up a wine cube to move one step closer to Rome, and then this gets flipped over. The final phase of a player's turn is to resolve any privilege tokens that may have been on the Emperor's card that you chose. So we're going to talk about the end of the round in a little bit, but at the end of the round, any Emperor cards that were not, using, uh, not chosen get a privilege token placed on them. Ones that were turned face down don't get a privilege token, they're just going to get turned face up. So as the game goes on, privilege tokens can accumulate on these cards. A maximum card can ever have is three of these privilege tokens. So let's say it's later in the game, and this card had two privilege, let's say this card had three privilege tokens on it, since that's the most it can ever have, and I choose to resolve this one. I can pay one wine cube to resolve it. This basically means now I get to draw three privilege cards from the privilege deck. Now I'm ever only able to keep one unless I have this building that lets me keep an additional one. So if there was only one token on this card, obviously I'm going to draw the top card and just keep it. Two tokens, I draw two cards and choose which one to keep. So in this example there's three, so I'll draw three cards, choose which one to keep, and then discard the remaining ones, again, unless I had the power to keep two of the cards that I drew. After you resolve the privilege phase and have chosen the privilege card, the tokens simply get discarded, and as normal, the chosen action card gets turned over. So since we're here, let's take a look at all the different types of privilege cards. Uh, the first type is the one that allows you to move one step closer to Rome. And keep in mind, these privilege cards can be kept secret until you decide to use them. You can use privilege cards at any time during your turn, but keep in mind you can only use this one step card once per turn. The rest you can use um, any time during your turn. These cards give you immediate resources. This would give you a grain cube and a cube of your choice, water and your choice, wine and your choice, this immediately gives you either a Centurion or a Virgin token. The other types of cards are endgame victory point cards. So these are always kept hidden until the end of the game. So you can see for each remaining blue cube you have at the end of the game, you'll get a point, 
a point for each yellow cube, a point for each red cube at the end. For every virgin you have, two points. So if you have three, you can get six. That's the maximum. For each centurion, you get two for a maximum of six. It's important to remember that you can only ever have or play, actually, one of these cards at the end of the game. So if you had two identical victory point cards, you're only going to be able to score one of those. This one, for each building you have, get two points for a maximum of six, since you can have a total of three buildings. For every five money you have, you get two points. For every three money you have, you get one point. So again, you can only score these separately. So if you have 13, you can get uh, two and two, four points for the, for the first 10, and then one point for those final three. And the final one is if you're married, you get three victory points. One special point, if this is a two-player game, the start player, once they choose the first Emperor card to resolve, they can choose any other card to turn over, just to simulate additional players being in the game. So it's just the start player that would make their decision after they've resolved their Emperor card. But at the end of the round, all the cards will get turned face up. So let's qu quickly talk about the end of round procedure. So once all players have taken their turn, all five phases of their turn, then we resolve the end of round. So any face-up card that wasn't used in the prior round gets one privilege token placed on it. So those three cards weren't used, so they'll get a privilege token on. Remember, you can always ever only have a maximum of three. So if this already had three tokens on it, it doesn't get any more. And then once you've placed the privilege tokens, then all the face down cards can get reset for the next round. And then before you're ready to start, you've got a reset turn order. So you're going to see who's in possession of the Fortuna card. Here it stayed in possession of the blue player. So they will retain first player position. And then the remaining player order is determined by who is higher on this money track. Since this is a two player game, it's easy. But if there were more players, you would use whoever has the most money would get to go higher in turn order. If two players were tied on money, it's whoever's closest to the starting player in clockwise order would break the tie and go higher in turn order. So finally, let's talk about how the game ends. The game will end once one player has made it all 15 steps to Caesar's Palace in Rome. The first player to do that during their turn you can see we started with three privilege, privilege tokens here. So the first player to do that will draw three privilege cards. They're only able to keep one, even if they have the building. This is different. They're only able to keep one. The two that they don't choose are left here in the middle. Normally the cards that aren't chosen are discarded. At the end of the game, the two cards they don't choose are left here in the middle. Now once the end of round is triggered, you're going to complete the round. So each player, unless it was the last player that ended the game, any remaining players in the round will get a chance to complete their turn. If they also end their turn and are able to get to Rome, they can look at one of the final two cards and select one, and then if a third player makes it, they can take that last privilege card. If at the end of the game a player was not able to at least get to the 10 spot, they are automatically disqualified from winning you at least have to get past these gates on space 10 or beyond to be eligible to win. Victory points are determined by how many steps to Rome that you have. So if you made it all the way to Rome, you get 15 victory points. If you were two steps short, then you would get 13 victory points. So you start by how many steps you were able to get to Rome, and then you simply just add on any end game victory point cards and the most victory points wins the game. If there's still a tie, it's the player that achieved the most steps towards Rome, then whoever has the most money, then the most centurions, and then finally the most virgins going down that order as potential tie breaks. So that's everything you need to set up and play Fortuna.